Good afternoon. I'm Commander Ibad Khan, and I'm representing the Clinician Outreach and Communication Activity, COCA, with the Emergency Risk Communication Branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I'd like to welcome you to today's COCA call, what clinicians need to know about dengue in the United States. All participants joining us today are in listen-only mode. Free continuing education is offered for this webinar. Instructions on how to earn continuing education will be provided at the end of the call. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all planners and presenters must disclose all financial relationships in any amount with ineligible companies over the previous 24 months, as well as any use of unlabeled product or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners and presenters wish to disclose they have no financial relationships with ineligible companies whose primary business is producing, marketing, selling, reselling, or distributing healthcare products used by or on patients. Content will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept financial or in kind support from ineligible companies for this continuing education activity. At the conclusion of the session, participants will be able to accomplish the following. Describe current dengue epidemiology and the populations who are at greatest risk for dengue and severe dengue in the United States. Recognize the three phases, febrile, critical, convalescent, and the three severity levels of symptomatic dengue, dengue, dengue with warning signs, severe dengue, based on a patient's clinical and laboratory findings, and identify the indicated treatment group A, B, or C, including hospital admission and intravenous fluids management recommendations based on dengue phase and severity. After the presentations, there will be a Q&A session. Please submit questions at any time during today's presentation to ask a question using Zoom, Click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, then type your question in the Q&A box. Please note that we often receive many more questions than we can answer during our webinars. If you're a patient, please refer your questions to your healthcare provider. If you're a member of the media, please contact CDC Media Relations at 404-639-3286 or send an email to media at cdc.gov. I would now like to welcome our presenters for today's COCA call. We are very pleased to have with us Dr. Laura Adams and Dr. Liliana Sanchez Gonzalez, both of whom are epidemiologists in the dengue branch in the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases at CDC's National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases. It is my pleasure now to turn it over to Dr. Laura Adams. Dr. Adams, please proceed. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Next slide, please. We'll start with a background on dengue epidemiology. Next slide. And next slide. Dengue is caused by dengue viruses one through four, sometimes called serotypes, all of which can cause disease. Infection with the dengue virus leads to lifelong type-specific immunity against the infecting dengue virus and short-term cross-protective immunity to the other dengue viruses, usually for about one to three years. Next slide. There's also genetic variation within dengue virus types, with some variants showing higher levels of virulence. You can see an example of this in the image on the right, which shows different variants and genotypes within each of the four dengue viruses. However, it can be difficult to ascertain the role of virus-specific factors as additional factors such as age and the time between infections has also been shown to play an important role in the risk for severe disease. Next slide. Dengue is primarily a mosquito-borne disease spread through the saliva of infected mosquito bites. Aedes aegypti is the most common vector shown in the image on the top right. However, Aedes albopictus, shown on the bottom, can also sustain transmission. Other modes of transmission for dengue virus are less common 
but include vertical transmission from a mother to a baby, blood transfusion or organ transplantation, needle stick, mucocutaneous exposure, or hospital or laboratory accidents, breast milk, and rarely sexual transmission. Next slide. Many factors can affect an individual's risk for severe dengue. There's a known risk by age, with particularly higher risk among infants born to seropositive mothers, as well as elderly populations. The number of dengue infections and the time between those infections can also play a role. Although severe dengue can occur during any dengue infection, there's a higher risk on the second dengue infection compared to the first, third, or fourth infection. And last but not least, underlying comorbidities can also be associated with worse outcomes, including asthma, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and sickle cell disease. Next slide. Next. Among people infected with dengue virus, most, up to 60 to 80%, will be asymptomatic. Next. Of the 20 to 40% that develop symptoms, one to 5% will develop severe dengue. Next. And among people with severe dengue, more than 95% will survive. However, dengue can be fatal with higher rates if untreated or with inappropriate treatment. Next slide. Methods of dengue prevention are historically based on preventing mosquito bites and include the use of EPA registered insect repellents and wearing long sleeve shirts and long pants. Additionally, controlling mosquitoes around the home can reduce exposure, including having screens in windows and doors, staying in locations with air conditioning, and regularly emptying and cleaning water holding items that can serve as breeding sites for mosquitoes. Next slide. In 2021, a dengue vaccine was recommended for use by the ACIP in dengue endemic areas of the United States. This vaccine, called Dengvaxia, includes three doses and is recommended for people 9 to 16 years old with evidence of laboratory-confirmed previous dengue infection and living in dengue endemic areas. It is not recommended for travelers to endemic areas. Next slide. Let's talk briefly about global dengue epidemiology. Next slide. Dengue is the most important and most common virus transmitted by mosquitoes worldwide. Dengue occurs in tropical and subtropical areas as shown on the map. The countries shown in dark blue are considered to have frequent or continuous dengue transmission. The areas in light blue have sporadic or uncertain dengue transmission, and the areas shown in tan have no evidence of risk. Next slide. One of the concerns with dengue is that dengue incidence is likely to increase as global temperatures increase, as shown by the growing areas with environmental suitability for dengue transmission, shown on the bottom figure, compared with the figure on the top. This occurs because of the expanded range of the mosquito vector, as well as other factors promoting increased transmission. Next slide. During 2022, multiple countries have reported dengue outbreaks, shown by the areas in blue on the map. The colors by each country represent the dengue viruses or serotypes circulating in those areas. As you can see, many endemic areas report circulation of multiple dengue virus types. Next slide. Next, let's take a look at dengue epidemiology in the United States. First, it's important to know that dengue is endemic in six U.S. territories and freely associated states shown on this slide. These include Palau, the Federated States of Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, and American Samoa in the Pacific, and Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands in the Caribbean. Next slide. 
Dengue cases in U.S. states are usually associated with travel to endemic areas, although locally acquired cases have been reported in some states, including Florida, Texas, and Hawaii. However, there's a risk for local transmission of dengue because the mosquito vectors are present in multiple states, particularly in the southern United States, as you can see in the maps on the right side of the slide. Next slide. And in recent weeks, there's been an increase in travel associated dengue cases in the United States. This figure shows the number of travel associated dengue cases reported to Arbonet, the National Arboviral Surveillance System, by week of symptom onset, shown on the x axis. The height of the bar represents the total number of cases by week, and the color indicates the location of travel. During case investigations, Public health officials found that the majority of the recent cases reported travel to Cuba, shown in purple. Travel to all other locations is shown in gray. Clinicians should have a high level of suspicion for dengue among febrile patients reporting recent travel to Cuba or the Caribbean region. And I'll now pass the microphone to Dr. Liliana Sanchez, who will talk more about dengue clinical presentation and recommendations for case management. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. Adams, and good afternoon. Next slide. During the next 30 minutes, I will present an overview of the general concepts and recommendations for the clinical classification, the clinical course and assessment, laboratory aspects, and management of dengue. Next slide. During this section, I hope to be able to give you some tools to be prepared to one, recognize, and two, manage dengue as not recognizing this disease continues to be one of the main causes of death among dengue patients. And if you have clinical suspicion, you should monitor and manage patients as dengue, as appropriate and timely management with IV fluids can be life-saving. Next slide. Let's start with the clinical classification and course of dengue disease. The clinical classification of dengue was updated by the World Health Organization in 2009. This classification by severity aims to be more useful to guide clinicians' decisions as to where and how intensively the patient should be observed and treated. There are three clinical categories, dengue, dengue with warning signs, and severe dengue. Next. You should suspect dengue in a patient who lives in or has traveled to previous place. Previous place, thank you. Or has, uh, in a patient who lives in or has traveled to an endemic area and presents with fever and two or more criteria in this list. Nausea and vomiting, rash, aches and pains that include headache, retroorbital pain, myalgia and arthralgia, a positive tourniquet test and leukopenia. Next. If the patient also presents with any of the criteria in this list, then the clinical classification corresponds to dengue with warning signs. Persist, um, abdominal pain or tenderness, persistent vomiting, defined by WHO as three or more episodes in an hour or four or more episodes in six hours. Clinical fluid accumulation, mucosal bleeding, lethargy or restlessness, postural hypotension, liver enlargement of two centimeters, of more than two centimeters and a progressive increase in hematocrit. These warning signs are very helpful to identify patients who might progress to severe disease. And it's very important that we assess them in all patients that we suspect dengue, as patients with warning signs should undergo medical observation or hospitalization. Next. Those patients who present with any of these manifestations severe plasma leakage, that is the hallmark of severe dengue, that is leading to shock or respiratory distress, severe bleeding defined by the clinician and usually corresponding to gastrointestinal bleeding, and severe organ involvement that most commonly manifests as hepatitis, encephalitis, and myocarditis. These patients are classified as severe dengue. Next. So every time dengue is suspected in a patient, we should use this classification to determine severity of disease. 
As you see, the case definition for dengue is broad, and that is the intention of this classification, to have a sensitive case definition with which the majority of dengue patients can be identified. The majority of dengue patients will be in the first group. You still can see and find sometimes the old classification that included the very well-known term dengue hemorrhagic fever. But this current classification here tries to take away the focus from platelets counts and bleeding and put it into the severe dengue manifestations. Patients with severe dengue don't necessarily present with bleeding and shock is usually the most common severe manifestation. Next. Besides the classification of severity, we need to be aware of the clinical course of dengue. After the patient is bitten by the mosquito, the incubation period is usually short, four to seven days, but it can go as long as 14 days. Remember that most dengue infections will be asymptomatic or will result in mild disease. In symptomatic patients, the typical clinical course of dengue has three phases, virile, critical, and convalescent. Next slide. Starting with the febrile phase, when the patient presents with the common symptoms of dengue and that usually lasts two to seven days. Know that the patient is viremic during this phase, even a couple of days before the symptoms start, which means that a mosquito that bites them can become infected and continue transmission. This is important if you live in a place with dengue vectors. During the febrile phase, the most common clinical problems include dehydration, and febrile seizures and neurological disturbances in young children. The effervescence, this is the abatement of fever to less than 38 Celsius or 100.4 Fahrenheit degrees, occurs on day three to eight. After the febrile phase, most patients will start to improve. Next slide. But some patients will enter the critical phase that starts with the effervescence. It lasts one to two days, and is characterized by an increase in capillary permeability. It is when extravasation of fluid into the interstitial space or plasma leakage usually occurs. Some patients might progress to this phase without the abatement of fever. And then besides the effervescence, this phase can be identified by the increase in the hematocrit or hemoconcentration because there is plasma leakage, but the red blood cells are too large to pass into the interstitial space. Warning signs that we all have memorized by now occur in this phase. And, it's, and the most common clinical problems correspond to the progression to severe manifestations of the disease. Next slide. The last phase of dengue is the convalescent phase that lasts about three to five days. In this phase, the extravascular fluid is reabsorbed in a gradual manner. And the clinical problems in this phase include hypervolemia and pulmonary edema, many times caused by excessive IV fluids administered to the patient during the previous phases. Next slide. So important things to remember here, the presentation of dengue can change quickly. The critical phase usually lasts only 24 hours. It is very important to monitor and identify warning signs and severe criteria to classify your patients and then be able to manage them appropriately. Plasma leakage and progression to severe disease usually happens in the critical phase, and it's very important that we're able to identify. And shock, not bleeding, is the most common severe dengue manifestation. Next slide. Now let's talk about clinical assessment. Next slide. When we have a febrile patient with a potential exposure to dengue, the overall assessment should include several criteria. The diagnosis, is it dengue? Does it meet the case definition criteria? Was the exposure within 14 days? Do you have another diagnosis for this patient? The classification that we see that correspond to the severity of disease. Do your patient, does your patient have warning signs? Is the patient already in those severe dengue? The phase, as knowing in which phase of disease the patient is, viral, critical, or convalescent will help you determine how often you want to monitor your patient. Comorbidities or other conditions that increase the risk of severe disease in your patient. And then based on those four things, you assign an intervention category A, B, or C. I want to emphasize that the assessment and the management of dengue patients 
usually doesn't require very specialized tests or interventions, especially if you suspect the disease early and intervene on an opportune manner. Dengue clinical presentation is dynamic and complex, but the treatment is relatively simple, inexpensive, and very effective. We are able to successfully manage dengue patients in low resource areas and in primary care facilities. Dengue deaths are preventable, and clinicians who are training recognition and early treatment with IV fluids are the most important resource, resource we have to prevent them. Next slide. During the history taking and the physical exam, these are some of the main criteria we want to assess. For fever, we want to know when the fever started, if it was measured. Dengue fever is abrupt and can be very high, 104 Fahrenheit or 40 centigrades, if the fever has already started to decrease or if the patient is no longer febrile, is in the purposes. Besides the case defining symptoms of dengue, patients can also present with respiratory symptoms, other gastrointestinal symptoms like anorexia, anorexia, and other symptoms like lymphadenopathy or conjunctival injection. To assess hydration status, you need to know if the patient is able to drink fluids and how is the diuresis. Are other things affecting the hydration status like diarrhea or vomiting? Of course, warning signs that you should always ask and assess about them. And here is the list again. Examine the skin for rashes, including the abdomen, the back, and the limbs, and examine mucosas for bleeding. Sometimes mild bleeding can be missed in the nose and gums. Ask for changes in color in stools and urine that can indicate bleeding too. Assess changes in mental status, especially in children, and assess chronic and social conditions that can put your patient at high risk for severe disease. Another important aspect to assess in dengue patients, of course, next, is plasma leakage that deserves its own slide. Severe plasma leakage is the most serious complication that distinguishes dengue from severe dengue. Signs of plasma leakage include hemoconcentration that you can identify if the patient hematocrit is 20% or higher than their baseline. It's very important to always obtain a baseline hematocrit in the first medical encounter with a suspected dengue because this will be your baseline and will allow you to identify hemoconcentration later. Or if after administer IV fluids, the patient hematocrit drops 20% or more which indicate that the patient was hemoconcentrated and you are diluting the intravascular fluid. Other important sign of plasma leakage is clinical fluid accumulation that you can suspect and assess through the clinical presentation with respiratory distress or abdominal discomfort or flank pain. And you can confirm with imaging, including chest x-rays and abdominal ultrasound. Next slide. And shock is the main manifestation of severe dengue, and unrecognized shock is another common cause of death among dengue patients. It's very important to remember to always look for signs of uh, for early signs of shock, not only decompensated or hypotensive shock. Look for narrow impulse pressure. This is when the difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressure is 20 or less. For delayed capillary refill, more than two seconds or for tachycardia in the absence of fever. Next slide. Now let's see the different types of rashes that present in dengue patients as their presence can help us guide our clinical suspicion. With the abrupt onset of fever, next. Right here, next. Dengue patients can present with marked flushing of the face, neck, and chest. In this period, they can also present with red lips and an injecting pharynx, and sometimes patients are diagnosed as pharyngitis in this period and just sent home. Next slide. During the febrile phase, this is days two to six. Next. Patients may present with a macula papula rash that usually starts in the trunk and spreads to face and limbs. It is blanchable, as you can see in the bottom picture, and it may become scaly. The second picture corresponds to the patient in the previous slide. She presented with both rashes. Next slide. And during the convalescent phase, next, 
patients can present with a very characteristic rash known as islands of white in a sea of red, the islands being the normal skin and usually presenting in the lower limbs. The rash can be very pruritic, and we have seen cases where patients have mild symptoms during the febrile phase and only come to see physicians when during the convalescent phase because of the discomfort with this pruritic rash. Next slide. Regarding bleeding in dengue, only about a third of patients with non-severe dengue will present with minor hemorrhagic manifestations. The occurrence of severe bleeding, that is usually gastrointestinal bleeding, has been associated with prolonged shock, another reason to identify shock early, and metabolic acidosis. Gastrointestinal bleeding might be occult. It's important to ask patients about stool characteristics. The first picture here is showing a petechial rash, and the second picture is showing skin bleeding manifestations after the use of a blood pressure cuff in a dengue patient. Next slide. The clinical diagnosis of dengue can be challenging, as many other illnesses can present similarly early in the disease course. In general, the top three differential diagnoses in return travelers to the tropics with fever are malaria, dengue, or typhoid fever. Dengue patients are often tested for malaria because the two diseases can look very similar. Other considerations should include influenza, other arboviruses like Zika and chikungunya, measles, leptospirosis, yellow fever, and now, of course, COVID-19. We should obtain a detailed history of immunizations, travel, and exposures that guide the differential diagnosis. We don't have time to go in depth on the many differential diagnoses and the fascinating topic of fever in the return uh, traveler, but I want to highlight here a couple of things. During the critical phase, dengue and preeclampsia can be challenging to distinguish, as both can present with thrombocytopenia, plasma leakage, impaired liver function, among other common signs. Dengue then should be also suspected in pregnant women. Abdominal pain in dengue can mimic acute abdomen, and this is usually due to collections of retroperitoneal fluid that result from excessive vascular leakage. Next slide. Here are some clinical clues that can help you increase your clinical suspicion. If your patient doesn't have these, they still can have dengue, but this might be helpful. Facial flushing has been identified as a predictor of, the, of dengue infection in some studies, and headache with retroorbital pain is very characteristic of uh, patients with dengue. A positive tourniquet test during the febrile phase can help you suspect dengue, and if your patient had warning signs, especially abdominal pain in the presence of fever and typical symptoms of dengue, this might help guide your diagnosis too. After the effervescence, if you have a patient with proliferations, bradycardia, or shock, this also can be a, a good sign that your patient has dengue. Although uh, if you are seeing your patient after shock, this, it might be too late. Next slide. Now I want to do a self-knowledge check for all of you. This is a 17-year-old female from Puerto Rico who is visiting relatives in New York. She presents with fever for four days, the highest measure yesterday at 103 Fahrenheit. She has headache, myalgia and arthralgia, sore throat, and five episodes of vomiting this morning. Here are the vital signs. The blood pressure is normal. I'll let you calculate the pulse pressure. She's tachycardic. She has a normal respiratory rate, and she's viral with 38 uh, Celsius. We want to choose the true statement. A, patients with dengue do not present with respiratory symptoms, therefore this patient does not have dengue. B, it is more likely that this patient has malaria than dengue. C, this patient is in the febrile phase, given the temperature. Hence, we are not concerned for progression to severe disease yet. And D, dengue should be considered as the patient is from a dengue endemic area. This patient has warning signs for severe dengue and should be hospitalized. I will give you a couple of seconds to think about this. Next slide. I hope you all chose the correct answer, that is D, 
and let's see why the other three are false. Less common symptoms of dengue include respiratory symptoms like cough, sore throat, and runny nose. B, there is no malaria in Puerto Rico, but there, there is dengue and is endemic. C, the effervescence can occur gradually as we discussed before, and the critical phase can start with the patient still has low fever. And D is correct. Persistent vomiting is a dengue warning sign, and this patient should be under medical observation or hospitalized. Next slide. Now regarding lab diagnosis and workup, next slide. Most likely you won't be able to confirm the diagnosis during your patient's febrile and critical phase. And the management of these patients should be based on clinical suspicion and evaluation. Next slide. Here is the course disease that you're already familiar with. In dengue, we can detect the presence of the virus with molecular tests and determine if the patient was exposed recently or in the past using serological tests to detect antibodies against the virus. It is important to remember to obtain a sample for molecular testing as early as possible during the febrile phase. Next. A real-time RT-PCR assay that can detect the virus RNA is also used to determine which of the four dengue types is causing infection. Patients are most likely to be positive during the first five days of disease, but we test during the first week, since the, vi since the virus can be detected for a longer period. Next. NS1 is another molecular test that look for the non-structural protein of the virus and is usually positive during the first days of disease. Next. For serological testing, IgM usually becomes detectable around day four or five. And this is important because if you test for IgM before this time, you can obtain a negative result even if the patient really has dengue. IgM can stay positive for several weeks to around three months, sometimes late, longer. A convalescent specimen is needed to make a diagnosis of dengue when your initial IgM is negative and disease was not confirmed with a molecular test. Next. An IgG is detectable around day eight to 10 and persists for years, even for life. IgG alone does not indicate active dengue infection. A convalescent sample showing a four-fold increase can confirm dengue diagnosed, but is rarely used. Next slide. Next slide. It is important to remember that dengue is a national notifiable disease. And if you suspect dengue, you should report the case to your local health department. Rapid diagnostic testing is not available, but RT-PCR, NS1, and IgM testing can be arranged through your health department, and they can help you determine the recommended test, test based on your patient's symptom onset. Some private labs also have dengue testing available. Next slide. As we mentioned before, it is recommended that during the first encounter with a suspected dengue patient, you obtain a complete blood cell count so that you have a baseline hematocrit, the most important, a platelet count, and leukocytes count. The labs listed here are also recommended to be performed in the workup of patients with possible dengue especially those who need inpatient management. A metabolic panel can help determine electrolyte imbalances and kidney function. Serum protein and albumin, le albumin levels are important to determine in the context of plasma leakage. A liver panel, specifically transaminases, AST and ALT, and a coagulation panel. According to the clinical presentation, patients will require additional tests like cardiac enzymes. Next slide. Common lab findings in the CVC include leukopenia, hemoconcentration, and thrombocytopenia. During the febrile phase, patients can have normal lab results, and at the end of the febrile phase, beginning of the critical phase, leukopenia with neutropenia and lymphocytosis can be present. For hematocrit, the increase also happens at the end of the febrile phase beginning of the critical phase and starts to recover as the critical phase ends. Platelets might take longer to decrease. A normal platelet count during the febrile phase doesn't rule out dengue. 
the, low, the lowest platelet count usually coincides with the highest hematocrit during the critical phase. Platelets can also take longer to improve, and patients can have thrombocytopenia well late into the convalescent phase. Other common findings include elevated liver enzymes, ASD and ALT, that is very common in dengue cases, even in non-severe dengue cases. So next slide. Now for dengue treatment, next slide. It is important to remember that the standard of care is supportive management. There is no curative treatment or antiviral available for dengue, but proper treatment with IV fluids can reduce case fatality rate to less than 1%. Next. Depending on clinical manifestations, patients will be assigned to group A and be managed as outpatients, group B and require observation or hospitalization, and group C for emergency treatment. Next slide. CDC has a dengue pocket guide available that can guide you to the classification of patients in these treatment groups and the algorithms for management. Next slide. The pocket guide looks like this. It is available in English and Spanish and can be very helpful to quickly, to quickly follow the current treatment guidelines. We are currently reviewing this uh, pocket guide to make it, to improve it, to modernize it, to make it more friendly and more comprehensive. So stay tuned because we should have uh, an updated pocket guide soon. Next slide. The majority of patients will be assigned to group A and can be managed as outpatients. This includes patients who don't have warning signs, can tolerate oral fluids, and have a normal urine output. Ideally, with these patients, you should follow them every day, and you should obtain a daily CBC too, until they are out of the critical phase. This is 48 hours after fever disappears or after the fervice. Very detailed instructions should be given to your patient so that they can recognize warning signs and they can come back if the warning signs appear. And you should look for warning signs and other things like signs of dehydration during your daily as, uh, assessment. Febrile patients should be placed under a mosquito net, rest in bed, drink abundant oral fluids, and use paracetamol for managing fever. I want to emphasize here that oral fluid intake has been associated with lower rates of hospitalization among children, and oral fluids intake should be encouraged in all patients. Patients should not receive aspirin or NSAIDs, or NSAIDs and this can as these can increase the risk of bleeding. Next slide. Patients with warning signs, coexisting conditions that increase the risk of severe dengue, or social circumstances that prevent them to be able to quickly return to hospital if needed are assigned to group B. These patients should be under observation. In countries where dengue is endemic and there are undergoing outbreaks, this observation usually happen, happens in dengue units, um, but in the context of the US, this most likely will correspond to hospitalization instead. For these patients, they also should be under bed rest and under a mosquito net. You should obtain baseline laboratories, start an IV line, monitor ins and outs. And if the patient has warning signs or inadequate oral fluids intake, you should start isotonic crystalloid solutions in a stepwise manner. The hematocrit should be monitored every four to six hours if you started IV fluids. Next slide. And if you remember our patient from Puerto Rico, this patient will be included in group B of treatment. The guide will give you instructions on taking a baseline hematocrit. Next slide, next. Here, and start IV fluids, IV fluids on a stepwise manner. This is key. In dengue, we might need to increase or decrease the IV fluids rates, always based in the clinical response of the patient. In this case, I was the previous, 
In this case, for example, we start with five to seven meals per kilogram per hour per couple of hours, and we follow with three to five meals per kilogram per hour for the next four hours. Next. Then we reassess the response, both clinically and with a hematocrit to determine the next steps. The guide will tell you to, next, either decrease IV fluids rates, in this case to two to three meals per kilogram per hour, if there is an adequate response, or next, increase the IV fluids rates if the response is not adequate. As you can see, dengue management requires frequent monitoring of vital signs, clinical response to IV fluids, and hematocrit changes. It can be very time consuming, and in the, especially in the context of dengue outbreaks. And you can see why health systems can collapse if there is a sharp increase in the number of dengue cases. So next slide. Those patients who have shock, either compensated or decompensated, are assigned to group C and require emergency treatment. The IV fluids management in these patients is more aggressive, using boluses of 10 to 20 ml per kilogram in short periods, and they require a more frequent monitor of hematocrit. As we are giving these patients higher quantities of IV fluids, we should monitor for signs of fluid overload included tachypnea, low oxygen saturation, increase in liver size, and peripheral edema, among others. Details on specific IV fluids doses are included in the current WHO and CDC guidelines, and you can easily access them online. Next. And here I want to show you some of the guiding principles of fluid management in dengue, some of which you already know and we already saw but it's important to have in mind every time you start IV fluids in a dengue patient that you should limit IV fluids in the febrile phase. If your patient is not dehydrated or there is no other reason to administer IV fluids, these are not needed, needed during the febrile phase. You usually only need IV fluids for 24 to 48 hours, the time that the critical phase lasts. Give only isotonic solutions. And it's key to give only the minimum IV fluids required to restore intravascular volume, maintain good perfusion, and an urine output of at least 0.5 mils per kilogram per hour. Every time you implement an intervention, you should monitor signs of fluid response and reassess. If the patient is responding, you may want to decrease the rate of IV fluids. Next slide. You should use the ideal body weight to calculate maintenance fluids in overweight or obese patients. And remember that extravasated fluids remain in the body and will need to be reabsorbed during the convalescent phase. You should monitor for fluid overload. Although crystalloids are the first choice for fluid replacement in dengue, and, more, and most evidence do not show advantages of using colloids over crystalloids for initial IV fluid therapy, there are some situations where WHO contemplates the use of colloids, included when three, including when three boluses of crystalloids have been administered without response. Next or when the blood pressure needs to be restored urgently. Previous, please. Blood transfusions should be given as soon as severe bleeding is suspected or recognized, but blood products should be used with caution because of the risk of fluid overload. Next. Some don'ts in dengue management include to do not use corticosteroids, they have not been demonstrated to have a benefit in dengue severity or dengue progression. Do not use NSAIDs as they, can, as they can increase the risk of bleeding. Do not give intramuscular injections and do not give prophylactic plague transfusions. These have also not demonstrated any benefit in dengue patients. Next slide. Dengue patients can go home when they have been 
infrarial for more than 48 hours, when there is an improvement in their clinical status, when the platelet count has an increasing trend. As we saw before, the platelets don't need to be completely recovered in order for the patient to go home. If they are going into an increasing trend, the patient can go home. And where the hematocrit is stable without the use of IV fluids. Next slide. And to conclude, I hope that we can um, continue to think dengue in all the patients that have been exposed, have been potentially exposed to dengue in the previous two weeks and present with fever. Remember that unrecognized disease is a common cause of death and the early recognition of disease and appropriate clinical management with IV fluids can be life-saving. If you have ever listened to me before talking to dengue, you might know this picture. And I like it very much because it's um, a child who came for an post-hospitalization checkup after dengue. And his most important problem at the time was that his dinosaur was broken. So the physician at the hospital fixed it and all his problems, dengue-related and non-dengue-related, were solved. And this is what we can do when we recognize dengue early and we treat it the right way. Um, dengue appropriate treatment can be life-saving. Next slide. Here is the dengue branch contact information in case you have any questions regarding dengue epidemiology or dengue clinical management. We're always happy to receive any question or concern you might have. And now I'll pass it uh, back to our moderator for the Q&A section. Presenters, thank you so much for providing this timely information to our audience. We will now go into our Q&A session. And for our audience, please remember to ask a question using Zoom. Click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type your question. So our first question asks, is there a difference in the prevalence of the four dengue virus types based on geographical location? Yes, thank you for the question. There are differences in dengue seer prevalence by location. And that really depends on the specific location um, in many places across the Americas and in Southeast Asia where there's uh, where dengue is endemic, all four dengue viruses circulate. And it really depends on the age of the population and the, the trends in recent dengue circulation of the viruses in that area as to what the specific seroprevalence is by dengue virus type. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have um, quite a few questions about uh, treatment. So here's one. The question asks, is albumin useful in dengue cases in the situation of shock? Um, there are a couple of very specific situations that the guideline um, accepts the use of colloids, but it's um, their main recommendation is to always start resuscitation with crystalloids and to continue the treatment with crystalloids unless there is no response to them. Um, but yes, there, there is place for the use of albumin and, um, and uh, dextran in dengue patients. Usually, where there is no response after three boluses of crystalloids in um, shock setting, cre uh, colloids can be administered. And when you have um, impending shock and you want to recover uh, the blood pressure quickly, you can also use one or two boluses of colloids. But the recommendation is to always start resuscitation with crystalloids. Thank you very much. Um, another question uh, regarding um, dengue um, treatment. If a patient is um, unable to take acetaminophen or paracetamol, can they use ibuprofen or naproxen? No, the recommendation for dengue patients is to not use ibuprofen, aspirin, or any NSAID as they can incre increase the risk of bleeding. Um, 
In these cases, what is recommended is just uh, physical measures to try to decrease fever uh, and oral hydration. But um, the specific, specific recommendation with evidence that they can increase bleeding is to not give NSAIDs to dengue patients. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, our next question is about the uh, transmission of dengue. And the question asks, are Anopheles species also capable of dengue transmission? Yes, Anopheles species are not known to be vectors of dengue. Um, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus are the primary vectors, although there are other mosquito species globally that have been identified to as being capable of transmitting dengue. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Our next question refers to the um, information that was shared regarding um, dengue transmission based on changes in climate. Have you seen dengue transmission in previously uninvolved localities more recently? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what's referred to by uninvolved localities. Um, I can say that there have been increases in the number of dengue cases and dengue burden overall in the past uh, 10 to 15 years, as shown through data reported to PAHO and the World Health Organization. So we know that dengue cases globally are increasing. Um, and the specific trends in more local areas really depends on, on what's happening in each local jurisdiction. Thank you very much. A follow-up question we received was uh, generally asking, considering the um, lack of familiarity in providers in continental US um, and that things might be going, um, you know, flying under the radar, do we have a, a, a good estimate of dengue cases in the continental US, perhaps Florida, et cetera? Yeah, so if I understand the question correctly, it's asking about dengue case ascertainment and reporting in the United States. And dengue is a nationally notifiable disease. So all cases that are suspected to be dengue or identified by laboratories should be reported to state and local public health officials, and those should all be captured in national numbers. There is a possibility of cases being underreported if patients don't seek care or if they're asymptomatic um, or if dengue is not su suspected among those patients. So we know that there could be cases occurring that are not reported to public health. However, all of the cases that are suspected or identified through laboratory diagnoses should be identified in the national numbers. Thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, we have a few uh, questions about uh, diagnostics. And um, um, the first question asks, please explain the tourniquet test. Now this is something you referred to a couple of times during the presentation and our attendee would like to know if you can explain the tourniquet test. Of course, and I apologize, I didn't explain it in the, in the presentation. The tourniquet test, um, what you do is to just take the patient's blood pressure and you record this. For example, let's say the, patient, the patient's blood pressure is right now 100 over 70. And then you inflate the cuff um, of your pressure, blood pressure cuff, you inflate your blood pressure cuff. Um, midway between those two numbers. So what you do is you add 100 plus 70, you divide it by two. So the average of your blood pressures, that will be 85. And you inflate your blood cough pressure, uh, your blood cough, blood pressure cough during five minutes. You wait for a couple of minutes and then you count the petechia that present below uh, the antecubital fossa. So one of the images that I showed in the presentation, I had a little square that was the antecubital fossa of a patient. So pretty much you add your blood pressure numbers, divided by two, inflate your blood pressure cuff, five minutes, wait two, and then you count. Usually if you have, um, usually it's positive if you have 10 to 20 petechia in the antecubital fossa. And it's very common that it's positive during the febrile phase 
in patients with dengue. Thank you very much. Our uh, next question asks, uh, do the recommended coagulation tests include screening for disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC? Not initially, no. Although this can happen in more severe deng severe dengue cases at the beginning, uh, most in most cases for most dengue um, patients, we only order the basic tests that I mentioned. And in many places, we don't even have availability of, of um, all the different panels that we have here. And usually we're able to follow up the patient and uh, manage it with the basic CVC and um, the liver enzymes. But no, not initially. If there are signs of uh, severe dengue or anything that can um, suggest that the test is needed, you can order it, but at the beginning it's not necessary. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question asks, you mentioned hypertension as a risk factor for severe dengue. Is coronary artery disease or other cardiovascular diseases a similar risk factor? Correct, yes. Um, hypertension, diabetes, and coronary disease are all risk factors for severe dengue. Thank you. Um, and we have time for one last question. And the question asks, um, does CDC offer dengue testing or should we consult with our health department? Yes, thank you. We would encourage uh, clinicians to consult first with local and state health departments, um, as many areas can provide testing there. Um, and we're always we're in close communication with those state health departments to provide additional testing um, if needed or if requested. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today with a special thanks to uh, Dr. Laura Adams and Dr. Liliana Sanchez Gonzalez for answering these questions and for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Next slide, please. All continuing education for COCA calls is issued online through the CDC training and continuing education online system at tceols.cdc.gov. Those who participate in today's live COCA call and wish to receive continuing education, please complete the online evaluation and post test before October 31, 2022 with the course code WC4520-092922. The access code is COCA092922. Those who will participate in the on-demand activity and wish to receive continuing education should complete the online evaluation and post test between November 1, 2022 and November 1, 2024 and use course code WD4520-092922. The access code is COCA092922. Continuing education certificates can be printed immediately upon completing your online evaluation. A cumulative transcript of all CDC ATSDR continuing education obtained through the CDC training and continuing education online system are maintained for each user. Today's COCA call will be available to view on demand a few hours after the live call at emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA. A transcript and closed caption video will be available on demand on the COCA calls webpage later this week. Please continue to visit emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA to get more details about upcoming COCA calls. We also invite you to subscribe to receive announcements for future COCA calls by visiting emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA forward slash subscribe ASP. You will also receive other COCA products to help keep you informed about emerging and existing public health topics. Stay connected by, with COCA by liking and following us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash CDC clinician outreach communication activity. Again, thank you for joining us for today's COCA call and have a great day.